When we imagine old plantations in the South, we might picture expansive lands, but not all of them look like this. Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to This House. Today we are taking a look at an urban plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. Charleston, South Carolina is famous for its unique style of residential architecture known as Charleston Single Houses, which line the streets on narrow lots. This style was popular in the early 1800s with large porches called piazzas welcoming guests to the property from the street. Perhaps the most elaborate of the Charleston single houses was that of Governor William Aiken Jr. It had been built in 1820, and when he purchased it, he began extensive renovations to greatly expand it. Unlike the urban dwellings of the North, which employed staff to run great estates, Governor Aiken labored 19 enslaved people at a city house for day-to-day -day operations, while nearly 900 labored off-site in the fields outside the city. With forced labor, the house was expanded to include slave quarters, branching off the main home to be concealed by a bricked-in courtyard. These alterations to the original house plan led to some truly unique interior spaces as we can glimpse the general layout of the main house and its floor plan. The piazza, due to its locked entrance, should be considered the first interior space of the home, offering a hybrid of indoor-outdoor living. The summer sun would heat the interior of the house to excruciating temperatures, so residents would utilize their south-facing porch as secondary living room where they could catch a cool breeze. But this entrance was removed during renovations, turning the piazza into a veranda. The new entrance of the house was situated at the northwest corner where guests would pass through a keystone archway to arrive in the split foyer. The stairs rounded out with cast iron balustrade sweeping below a candlelit chandelier, centered on two supporting, fluted Doric columns. Heading downstairs would take you to the housekeeper's room, storage rooms, and the cellar, but heading upstairs would take you to the main living quarters. To the left sat the gallery, where Governor Aiken would have displayed his fine art collection. While the room was square in plan, the walls were octagonally arranged with niches cut into the corners, creating the illusion that the room was not, in fact, square. To the right of the stair landing, you would find the drawing rooms, arranged as a double parlor, perfectly mirroring each other with identical window surrounds, wall panels, and fireplaces in each. Over time, a portrait replaced the rear-facing window, which would have otherwise overlooked the slave quarters. In a 3D model created by the Historical American Building Survey, we can see how these two rooms relate to each other. Next to the rear-facing drawing room sat the dining room, with dark, old-growth furniture contrasting with lightly colored walls and millwork, broken up by a gilded mirror extending from the fireplace's stone mantle all the way to the cornice. Just to the side of the dining room, beyond a glass pane door, a staircase rose to the second floor. Arriving at the second floor stair landing, you would pass below a keystone archway, the thickness of which was the same as the interior walls, to enter the central hall, which extended towards the second level of the veranda, dividing each bedroom and their respective dressing rooms from each other. Each bedroom boasted a south-facing window with elaborately carved millwork and formal furnishings, as well as plaster medallions suspending chandeliers from the ceiling. Following the staircase up to the third floor, we can look up to see an elaborate plaster medallion centered on the voidal space between the curving banisters. Up here we will see one of the few slave quarters incorporated into the main house, with decorative window surrounds and a fireplace, standing in stark contrast to the rest of the slave quarters extending from the rear of the house, many of which were not sealed off to the elements with dirt floors. This extreme duality of living conditions continued all the way through the American Civil War after which the house began to fall into disrepair without forced labor maintaining it. The plaster began falling from the humid walls as water leaked in through the ignored roof. The Aiken family lived in the house for 142 years, seeing their conditions reduced through each generation until it became essentially uninhabitable. In 1975, the house was too far gone to sell. The family donated it to the Charleston Museum, which then sold it to the historic Charleston Foundation, since then, several archaeological efforts have uncovered remnants, piecing together the lives of the enslaved families to paint a better picture of what life would have really been like on an urban plantation. In present day, the house is open to the public as a house museum. What did you find interesting about the Governor William Aiken house? Let me know down below in the comments section. I'll see you next time on This House.